Audience, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the 3D Print Authority podcast. This is a place where we come together to have a transparent and no BS conversation about 3D printing and technology. Uh, my name is Adam Fosnot. I'm your host and president of Power About 3D. Uh, joining me today is Melanie from Form Alloy. She is the founder and CEO, right? That's right. Yeah, okay. thanks for having me, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd invite you to um, introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, we already know your title, but um, anything about Form Alloy as a company um, or about you personally? Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, like you said, I'm the co-founder of Form Alloy. Uh, we were founded in 2016, so we've been going at this for about five and a half years. And of course, longer before that as a hobbyist and scientist just investing in the technology. So. Um, I'm also an aerospace engineer uh, by training and uh, professional experience prior to getting into additive manufacturing and, you know, excited to be here and share more about what we do. Very cool. Um, that's always a place that I like to start is kind of how you first got introduced to 3D printing as a technology and then how you transitioned into starting the company. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love talking about our journey and I think it's so interesting in additive manufacturing because everyone sort of has that path where it it sort of goes into additive all of a sudden. Um, you know, now there's careers in additive, but you know, when I was right. in school and before that, there wasn't a degree in additive manufacturing. So it's always interesting to see what was that point, what was the path at which it sort of diverged or, um, you know, changed to go into additive. So um, I, I have one of those similar stories. So I was, uh, first exposed to 3D printing a long time ago at, at Lockheed Martin as part of an engineering week project. I had prototyped this little uh, design and uh, there was a, a stereolithography system. And this is like, you know, 2004, 2005 timeframe. And so I got to see my, you know, little design kind of come to life. So that was exciting. Uh, and then, you know, sort of paused on the whole, you know, 3D printing out of manufacturing thing for quite some time and then picked it back up again, 2009, 2010 timeframe, more as a hobbyist. So, you know, went to some maker fairs, started investigating it just as a, you know, as a hobbyist uh, with my partner, we built a, uh, a, a just a small uh, polymer 3D printer and just, you know, thought it was an interesting technology. At the same time, I'm continuing my career uh, at Lockheed Martin, and I'm just realizing the importance of being able to get the right components to the right place at the right time. And that's okay. kind of when the intersection happened of there's this really interesting kind of fun technology as a hobbyist. And while there's real world applications, particularly in aerospace and defense in my case, and if we can make full quality parts on demand, there's a really big business case and need for that. Okay. That's awesome. I think back to like 2004, 2005, um, and your kind of origin story, your introduction to 3D printing is really similar to other people's where they first saw either a Stratasys or a 3D systems either in college or at maybe their first couple jobs. Um, but then nothing happened until kind of that 2009 to 2012 range when MakerBot, PrinterBot, some of those other startups um, started to make low cost printers um, and then things kind of exploded from there. Um, so Form Alloy makes, from what I understand, large scale DED metal 3D printers, but how, how would you describe it? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, we design and develop directed energy deposition uh, systems that range from the size of about a bread box, uh, about eight inches in X, Y, and Z, all the way up to over a meter in X, Y, and Z for our larger build volume systems. And we're really focused on those high value uh, industrial applications like aerospace, energy, transportation, and we do some high end consumer goods as well. Okay. And for anyone who isn't familiar, what is direct energy deposition? How does that process work? And how is that different from maybe uh, more typical metal printing methods like DMLS? Yeah, so with uh, direct energy deposition uh, with powder, which is what we do, we blow powder through a coaxial nozzle and then uh, 
heat it with a laser essentially, and then things are built up on a layer by layer basis. So um, another way to describe it would be is if you take a laser and you create a melt pool, you blow powder into that melt pool um, okay. and, and then build it up layer by layer. So the, the differences between some other technologies is that we're essentially blowing the powder where it's needed versus you know having a you know large bed of powder. Uh, and then with some of the other multi-step processes, uh, this is a single step process. So you get that full metallurgical bond. There's not a, you know, like a green state uh, of the part or anything like that. So you're, you're basically laser welding or laser cladding. So it's not, uh, although the, the systems are new, uh, the base technology behind it is, is a very mature technology. And we've just put a lot of science behind it to make it very controllable and repeatable. Okay. Yeah. When, when I think about it, it always reminds me of like MIG welding, but with powder or like laser welding, if you had like really big um, structures that you wanted to weld together. Is yeah. that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very similar to what we do. Okay, cool. So you worked in aerospace with Lockheed Martin, you mentioned, and then how did you transition to, to this new role? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like, you know, standard, you know, startup life where you continue on your career and you're investigating, you know, what you want to do on the side and you're sort of waiting for that signal to say, yes, you know, go do this, take the risk, jump all in. And so it, you know, it took a couple of years for me to, you know, make that leap, uh, take that leap of faith that's usually required if you're going to go all in and start your own business, you know, like you did, you're an entrepreneur yourself. Um, and so that's really what it was. It was just the interest that we were getting from, you know, customers like NASA and other industrial customers that, you know, were very interested in what we're doing. And that led me to believe that this is a viable business. And, and just from what I saw as well, uh, you know, on the aerospace and defense side, you know, it's, it's very challenging. Supply chain issues are very challenging. We've kind of seen that come to life over the past year. Um, and, you know, this is a technology that can certainly address that. Yeah, I'd love to dig more into supply chain issues in, in a little bit, because I think it's a really relevant topic today for a lot of industries. Um, I think when I look at other FDM startups, it seems really easy to kind of like get up and going. Like the machines are relatively cheap. Filament is everywhere. There's lots of standard rep rep components. Um, but making a DED system seems way, way harder was in the early days. Was this something that like you built in a garage or like how did the first prototypes get started? Yeah, I mean, the first, uh, you know, start of of the company was in a little 700 square foot rented uh, garage, essentially, uh, where we put the first system together. So when, when we got started, we investigated uh, multiple technologies. Okay. Because we knew that there was a need for what we were doing, but we wanted to find the best technology fit uh, for for you know what we were trying to do. And um, you know, DED was the the best technology that we investigated because you can work with such a wide range of materials. You can have the repair applications as well as the you know standard you know building part applications. Um, and so you know, although it was a very challenging type of system to design and make. make it was really the best fit for what we were trying to accomplish. And so we just had to go all in. Uh, but uh, my co-founder and partner is a an expert machine designer. So uh, he is uh, an absolute genius at designing the machines themselves. And, uh, you know, we have an excellent team, of course, of, you know, material scientists and mechanical engineers, electrical engineers that kind of help our systems come together. So it's definitely uh, a team effort. But yes, there was a lot of challenges, you know, getting that first machine kind of designed and built and, uh, you know, brought out to the marketplace. Okay. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I hear from metal printing companies is materials. Um, and I feel like a lot of people end up in a corner of only printing in 17.4 or 3.16 stainless. Um, so what was kind of the first material or two that you started working with? And then what materials are you working with today? Some of the first, we definitely started with uh, steel, uh, that was pretty common, and then also Inconel. So some of the, okay. the very first projects that we did uh, were with Inconel, which which prints really well uh, in DED. 
Since then, we have worked with uh, many more materials, you know, very interesting, you know, new materials, uh, you know, everything from titanium to copper alloys to, um, uh, you know, cobalt based alloys, and then a lot of custom alloys as well. Uh, so one of the benefits of DED is that uh, it can work with a very wide range of materials. If it's a weldable or castable material, we can typically build really well with it. Okay. And then based on all those different materials, again, just from what I hear from other metal printing companies, maintaining, um, I guess, the, the structure of the metal and how it binds to itself and keeping temperatures consistent um, and accounting for shrinkage and residual stress is, it's, it's hard. Um, how do you guys control kind of all of those factors? Yeah, I mean, there, there are still challenges with, with controlling all of that, but our machines uh, put a lot of focus on the in situ monitoring, monitoring and control aspects, which can help you control all of those things. So our machines can work in closed loop mode, for example, if you're doing process parameter development to help you identify what that sort of ideal build file looks like in terms of all your speeds and feeds and your laser power and your powder flow rates. Um, you know, all that can be controlled from a, a closed loop standpoint. And then when you're ready to go into production, then you can lock that file down and, and basically do a replay of that build. Uh, so that way, you know exactly what you're getting and you're not making changes on the fly uh, for a production build. Um, but there is some, you know, analysis that's required in the process param parameter development um, a piece of that flow is and it's very important um, to make sure that you're getting the desired end properties that you need for your application. Um, so that that shouldn't be, um, you know, taken for granted, I guess I want to say. Um, it, it is important to define those parameters up front and to understand your performance of the materials and make sure you're getting what, what you want in the end. Okay. Um, this seems like a very simple question, but given how complex what you do is, it doesn't feel super simple to ask it, but how accurate are the parts that you guys make? So it, it depends on the application and again, what the desired uh, resulting uh, build is by the user. So we work everywhere from about 0.6 millimeter spot sizes and up to six millimeter or greater. And okay. that's gonna determine how fine of a feature that you can get. And it's also going to help you determine build speed. And typically those are going to be a trade-off. So if you are going to be finishing, finish machining a part anyways, and you want to optimize for build speed, you can use a larger spot size with a higher power laser, get much more, uh, you know, fast deposition rates up to 15 pounds per hour of material, and then, you know, finish, you know, finish off the part. Uh, if you're trying to get a, uh, a very good geometry or perhaps you're building in areas that don't have a good uh, finishing process uh, defined for it, then you'll want to use a smaller spot size and go a little bit slower and that will give you a, you know, a better surface finish and, and better accuracy on your part. But typically from a, a bead width standpoint, um, about a 0.6 millimeter spot is about as fine as you go to still reap the benefits of doing DED. Okay. Um... Yeah, a 0.6 bead up to a six millimeter bead is a really big difference. I think when you look at different metal printing technologies or even plastic printing technologies, um, most people I think are on the smaller side of that range. Um, when you look at what you're doing compared to say DMLS or metal FDM, where does your technology really make sense? Uh, our technology makes sense for uh, a number of things. One, if you have uh, you know, build times that are important to you. Um, the other even more strong use case for it is very large builds. Um, so with this process, because we're blowing the powder where we need it, we're not really limited in build volume. Um, I mean, someone could ask for a, you know, a two meter or three meter system, and it's really just the size of your of your gantry uh, for your system. But the process is the same in terms of blowing powder where you need it, so it's very scalable. And then the last thing that I'll say that's 
uh, really unique about DED is that it's uh, very straightforward to use a multi-material uh, type of approach or functionally graded materials uh, as they're as they're typically called now um, to really achieve perhaps an enhanced performance of your component. So, you know, you can do really unique material combinations like copper alloys with nickel super alloys to get you, you know, good thermal properties, but also the strength. Um, you can use, you know, more inexpensive base material and then more expensive, uh, let's say, like corrosion resistant alloys uh, to finish the part off. Um, and so I think that multi-material is really important. And uh, I guess last but not least is the ability to add material to existing components. So either for a repair application, uh, you know, design change type application, if your tooling changes, you don't have to rebuild the entire thing, just, you know, build, rebuild the area that, that is changing. Um, and it's very straightforward to do that with DED again, because we're blowing the powder where we need it. So you're not, you're not limited to starting over with a part um, you can certainly, you know, build off of an existing part and get it back into service. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm summarizing those points, the first is multi-material metal printing. The second is part size. And the third is part repair. Perfect. Yeah, yep. Um, like build, enhance, repair. So build, enhance, repair. I love it. Um, a lot of people don't understand that metal 3d printing, I guess, outside of what you do is usually very small. Um, I used to have people ask for quotes for metal parts and like, oh, it's only 10 inches long. Um, and then the only people in the world who I could get a quote from were in Germany and it was thousands and thousands of dollars and nobody understood why it was so difficult. Um, so it's really cool to hear that part size is one of the key things that makes you different. Um, when it comes to multi-material, how many different metals are you able to put into a single part? Uh, I mean, it would really be only limited by the number of powder feeders that you have. Okay. Uh, because for us, it's just blowing the powder where it's needed. So it doesn't matter if that's, you know, one or four or 16 different, you know, alloy or alloy variations going into a single part. Uh, we do have a specialty piece of equipment that's focused on that. And it's called our alloy development feeder. Okay. And it's a 16 hopper system. So with that, it's very uh, straightforward to build with either 16 different materials or in the case of alloy development, you can have 16 different slight alloy variations, deposit them very quickly into your build and then do your analysis. Um, so again, it's, it's scalable. Um, you know, if you wanted to do, you know, 32 alloy combinations very quickly, you would have two alloy development feeders. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great application for this process for sure. Gotcha. And then when it comes to making new parts from scratch versus repairing existing parts, um, do you find yourself doing more of one than the other? Is it a 50-50 split? What are, what are people asking for more of? You know, we are starting to see more repair applications uh, come online because I think people are recognizing the, the power of it. Um, and it's also, you know, low hanging fruit in some ways. Uh, it helps people develop that business case and that, that initial use case to get them started uh, with DED. And then from there, they can go on to more, you know, complex type applications where they're building complex parts or then after that would be even, you know, building parts with multi-materials. So repair is a great kind of first use case um, and, you know, can typically be really cost effective because, you know, we typically find if, if we can do a repair for 25% or less than replacing the component, uh, that's typically a pretty good use case for our customers and um, also fairly straightforward to achieve with this process. Okay. What types of parts are people looking to repair? Are they like old aircraft parts? Are they tool and die parts? Uh, I'm imagining maybe die casting molds like what are people what what areas are people repairing in? yeah i mean tooling repair is one great example because typically you know tooling can be expensive it can have long lead times so that's one area and then we're seeing uh you know turbine blade repair uh aircraft components and then uh for the the air force right now we're doing some work on hypersonic repair so we're we're doing some repair for arc heater components uh, which are copper alloys um, and again, really anything that's high value or has a long lead time and uh, also could be failing at unpredictable rates. So that's that's another 
you know, benefit of having this on-demand repair capability is you can't always predict, you know, failure rates for certain components. And um, that's another use case for it. Gotcha. Um, hearing you talk about some of the key, like, areas where you're succeeding is so cool to me because it's outside of what so many people do with 3D printing. Like, it's such, um, I think, a specific like high dollar, very technical application. Um, and I just think it's so cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like so many people are just printing like little plastic boats. Um, and this is like light years ahead of that, but they're both under the same umbrella of 3D printing. Um, are most of your customers in aerospace specifically? I know you mentioned a few different areas, but just kind of as we're talking, it seems like that's the, the big standout market. Yeah, aerospace and defense is, is a big market for us. Uh, and now we're seeing comfort levels come from more uh, traditional uh, industrial type applications too, uh, which is a good thing because I think in some ways that's, that's kind of the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, aerospace and defense applications are, you know, very rigorous and they can require a lot of, you know, testing and, you know, certification plans. Um, if you're working in other industrial sectors and you just need to do repair of tooling, you not, might not necessarily, you know, care about, um, you know, all of the various material properties and optimizations that you might have to go through for aerospace. So, you know, aerospace and defense is a great place to be because it enables, you know, a lot of other industries. And I typically like to say, you know, people say, why did you start with aerospace and defense? You know, of, of all things, that's, that's one of the harder uh, you know, industries to foray into with a new technology. Uh, but from my perspective, if it's, if your components are good enough for aerospace and defense, they're certainly good enough to go in your vehicle or repair tooling uh, in, in a machine shop or, or maybe even repair, you know, uh, mismanufacturing, uh, you know, mistakes. So um, yeah, it's a great application. Yeah. I guess when you think about it, um, to your point, fixing tooling seems like such low hanging fruit compared to making aerospace grade parts. But if you start with making aerospace grade parts, it's pretty easy to work your way back to repairing tooling and like fixing a, a weld or adding tolerance to something. Um, I feel like all you would have to say is like, oh, well, it's good enough for NASA. And like, then people would just generally agree with you, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it is. It is. Uh, it is nice to have those use cases of you know rocket nozzle work and uh, some of the work that we do in the DoD, kind of on a resume for credibility to say, we we know that we can do this and and we can give you a high quality component. Right, right. Um, you said you had started in twenty sixteen, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're on a five and a half year journey at this point. Has anything stuck out to you as like the biggest challenge you faced so far, or the biggest hurdle you've had to to overcome? That's a good question. There have been, you know, a number of different hurdles that that we've overcome. You know, on the technology side, um, as a entrepreneur, you know, cash is always important because you have to have cash to fund your business. So um, we've gotten so over some challenges there and did some fundraising. And then, of course, uh, you know, no one could have expected the events of 2020, which was sort of a different type of challenge. And so I, you know, I was saying last year as an entrepreneur, I signed up for a roller coaster of, of things. I signed up for a roller coaster of, you know, technology and people management and, you know, cash and, um, you know, fundraising and all that I signed up for. I didn't sign up for last year. Um, right. <laughs> but it was a great, and nobody did, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that we were able to, you know, kind of not only survive, but thrive through that. And um, so that was one of the biggest challenges, just because it was unexpected. Um, and, you know, no one really had, you know, there's no mentors you could go to, to say, guide me through this, you know, talk me through this. It was just, you know, we had to do our best every day. Um, and, you know, the approach that we took is to, you know, keep our heads down and keep on developing the technology and, uh, you know, don't, don't pause, don't say we're going to, you know, we're going to take a break and, um, you know, let our guard down. We, we kept marching ahead um, as much as we could safely. And then, you know, also just putting our people first 
uh, was another big thing too, to keep our, you know, keep our team together and uh, keep us headed in the right direction. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been fun though. It's always fun overcoming the challenges and then you, you know, you, you become much closer to your team. So that's been nice. Um, the other, I guess, on a positive note, the surprise that I have is I feel like the AM community in general is a pretty tight knit community. And I, I sort of thought that in, when I was in aerospace and defense, but once I moved into AM, it's like AM is more of a big family. And I know it's cheesy to say that, but you know, even, even with your competitors, um, you're, you're friendly because it's, it's sort of like, we all have to work together to move this community forward and move the technology forward, whether it be, you know, polymer or powder bed or, you know, some other kind of printing. Um, we have to all get better as a community and we all have to help each other out, you know, move it forward and push it forward so we can really, you know, fully harness the power of it, which I don't think has been done yet. So that was a very long answer to a question, but <laughs> I hope to answer it. You, you did a great job and you touched on a lot of interesting points, I think. Um, the first one being fundraising, which is a challenge for anyone who seeks fundraising from what I've heard. Um, the second being 2020, which the challenge of all challenges. And to your point, it's not like you could just call up um, another 3D printing CEO and be like, hey, how maybe someone who's been at it longer and be like, hey, how what should I do? Because no one knew what to do. Um, and then additive being kind of a closer knit community, I think is something I can definitely agree with as I've met more and more people at different companies and I've learned how they've kind of moved uh, from other areas of engineering into 3D printing and maybe they've worked at distributors or different things. Um, there is some sense of camaraderie there where I really appreciate it. And it's something that like, we're all pushing collectively to make the technology more and more useful. Um, when you look at last year being so challenging, you mentioned a lot of good things about putting your team first and getting closer. Um, one question on that note is how big is your team at this point? And I know you mentioned supply chain challenges earlier. Was there any kind of unexpected positives for your team from last year? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a good point. And I think one of the positives in general for this industry was that we were really thrust into the spotlight. And, and I've said that before, but it's true, you know, 3D printing really in the last year, I think became a household name, started with the PPE, you know, great use case for it. It's basically showing the power of 3D printing. And so it really did thrust us into the spotlight and, and you know, gave us that chance to get the word out about the technology for people that might not have been, you know, hearing about it. And then also that comfort level, because there's a, uh, uh, you know, technology maturity that must be achieved in order to do things like mass production of PPE. So, um, you know, on the positive side, I think it was a great exposure to 3D printing in general, uh, you know, in the world. And I think, you know, from, from our team standpoint, you know, we talked about, we've been thrust into the spotlight as an industry and now is our time to shine. Now is our time to deliver these applications that have been, you know, promised for so long. Um, now is the time, so let's do it. Let's get it done. Um, so that was a really positive way to sort of, um, you know, handle the events of last year and and kind of keep us moving forward. Definitely, I think when kind of the the PPE trend started um, to emerge, I guess with three D printing, my first thought was this is going to be great for three D printing because people can't get parts that they need. And now, even if they were scared to try 3D printing before, now they don't have a choice. So it's like accelerating that trend of 3D printing, competing with mass manufacturing in a really cool way, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, to your point of you know supply chain issues, I mean, we're still seeing the effects of the supply chain challenges today. Uh, and so that's another great use case for, you know, 3D printing is, you know, taking control of your supply chain. And, you know, even if you don't fully convert, because I, I, I truly believe that, you know, our technology and, and any others in this space, they're just another tool in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're not going to, you know, do away with 
you know, all the things that we've learned and, and accomplished with traditional manufacturing. But it's important to have this tool, this advanced tool that can leapfrog you in product development or, you know, build things bigger that you can't build any other way or with multiple materials and or act as a backup when you have supply chain issues, um, either to take old components and be able to repair them and get them back into service or just have an alternate, you know, method to build that you have full control over. Definitely. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to transition over a little bit to some more high level questions. Um, looking at kind of all of your applications and things that you've printed over the years, is there anything that stands out to you as like, this is the favorite thing that our team has printed or like this application was really, really cool that you want to share? I think, uh, oh my gosh, there's so much. We do a lot of cool stuff. Um, some of the stuff I can't share, some sure. of the cool stuff I can't share, but you know, I think as a, an aerospace engineer, it's always exciting if we're doing any type of rocket nozzle geometry um, because you're really enabling, uh, you know, getting to space, um, you know, uh, reinvigorating, you know, human space flight or just the ability to get, you know, more cargo to space for technology um, and the future of, you know, what is a, a space, you know, colony going to look like with humans in it. We're enabling that. We're enabling what you know, what that's going to look like in the future. And that's super exciting. Um, on the more, you know, general side, I would say anything that we do with multiple materials is, is incredible because, you know, when I was in school and, you know, thinking about design, there was not a class that said, or, or a project that said, yeah, don't, don't worry about, um, if you want to have that part and it has multiple materials in it to get your thermals, right. Um, uh, you know, that didn't exist. It's like, no, pick a material, you know? Right. Um, and you know, so, you know, I have, I have, we have a lot of cool real, we're real world applications, but this is a nice part because you can see this transitions from copper to ink canal and back and forth. And, you know, with our process, this is very straightforward. And this is sort of like a, you know, rocket nozzle geometry, but we've just made it more complex to, to show off a little bit. Um, but I mean, it's just amazing. And when you're watching the build happen and you can see a part growing in front of your eyes and it's, you know, different materials, you know, going into that, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Anytime I see a multi-metal part or I hear about it, it blows my mind just a little bit to your, to your point, like thinking about design and uh, looking at thermal properties of materials and heat exchangers. Traditionally, it was always just pick your material, right? And then play with the shapes and do the best you can. But playing with multiple materials in the same build just gives you so many more options. Um, it's very cool. Um, when you look at the world of 3D printing kind of as a whole, uh, both metal and plastic, um, this is a very vague question, so it's okay if you need a minute. Um, what is one thing that you don't like about 3D printing? And sometimes people are like, oh, I don't like how slow it is. I don't like that every FDM printer um, is a bed slinger that just goes back and forth, like that just makes some people mad. Maybe you don't like that every 3D printer is black in color. Um, maybe we need more rainbow 3D printers. What, uh, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the thing that frustrates me a little bit about the industry is that um, it's typically held to higher standards than traditional manufacturing processes. So if we're trying to move things forward, you know, sometimes to make a change, there's there's some risk that has to be taken on, um, you know, with with some you know reasonableness put in there and, and some risk mitigation efforts. But um, you know, it's challenging if if we're building a component and it's something that uh, you know traditional might be a casting, but we're going to be held to higher standards than what the casting would hold because it's a tr more trusted process. So. Um, I guess if, if there's any way to sort of build that trust without just saying we need 10 years of, you know, continuous, you know, data and success in order to, to really trust this process, um, you know, especially with DED, because we're not, it's not a new technology, right? It's, it's based in, in welding and laser cladding, um, which is not brand new. Uh, and so if there's a way to sort of like accelerate that trust, you know, that's, that's what I would uh, do and kind of focus my attention on is, 
trust this process, you know, just like you would a traditional manufacturing process, you know, after you've done certain tests, but don't hold out of manufacturing to a higher standard than you hold your traditionally made components. Um, you know, take that leap of faith and, and reap the big benefits that go with that. Yeah, I can relate to so much of that frustration because I used to be in sales conversations for um, metal FDM systems, right? And we'd be talking about, well, what are you doing today? What are, what are your castings like? Um, and we'd, we'd talk through everything. And then a lot of times engineers would get stuck on, it has to be 100% dense, the metal part. I'm like, 100% dense doesn't exist. Like in any process anywhere, right off of a machine and just like the the expectations were somehow elevated super super high out of skepticism maybe um but it's definitely frustrating yeah yeah so you know if there's a way we can move that forward um and and sort of swap those expectations i think i think we can move together more quickly but um you know then again you know it's part of the journey. It's part of the story. And so if it takes extra time and that's what it takes to get there, we'll do it. Um, but just something to keep in mind, you know? <laughs> yeah. For, for anyone listening who's skeptical of 3d printing or using it for end use parts. Um, I think one thing that comes about if I was, if I was on the other side, um, case studies and stories of other people being successful should be very meaningful. And then also, um, you have to try it at some point, right? Because technology is going to continue to progress and you can't keep doing the same thing forever. Anyway, um, as, a, as a small rant there, um, outside of your products, your company, what you're doing, what's one thing that you're really excited about in 3D printing? So this could be a trend, a technology, or just something that you wanna see more of. Some people have said generative designs, people have said scanning. Um, I've really gotten answers all over the board. What, uh, what do you think? I think for me, it's two things. I mean, one is seeing the, the transition into production and, and we're starting to see that more ourselves, you know, this technology is ready. So if you have a production application, that's a good fit, uh, for this technology, we are ready to produce that for you or get you set up with the equipment so you can produce it yourself. So I'm super excited, the high throughput. Uh, and, and large scale size that is available now uh, to really take us into that, you know, production type of environment. And then the second thing that I'll say is uh, the time is so great to jump in. So if you have an application, it doesn't matter if it's polymer or metal or, or what technology across the spectrum, but now is a great time to jump in. Contact a company that you're interested in and have them help you get started on your journey. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a perfect fit for that one technology if you're not sure. Um, you know, reach out and, and send your part and say, hey, is this a good fit for your technology? Why or why not? And, uh, you know, let people like myself and, and my team and people at other companies sort of, you know, help guide you. So now's a great time. And I'm excited to see, we see more and more people sort of jumping in and taking that first step of just asking questions and, uh, sending over some part files and, you know, I see that increasing. So that's what really excites me is as people do that, there's going to be all these new applications that kind of come online that we're not even thinking of as equipment designers right now. So um, super, you know, excited to see where it's going to go and all the applications that all of you people are going to come up with in the future. Definitely. I think the, the bridge to production is a conversation that I've seen happening more and more and more over the last, just the last six or nine months. Um, so I do think it's an exciting time to be a part of the industry and working with other people who are, who are trying to achieve that. Um, before we sign off, uh, where can people learn more about Form Alloy? Where can people uh, learn more about you? And if there's any specific actions you'd like the audience to take, now's, uh, now's your chance. Okay, awesome. So uh, you can take a look at our website. It's www.formalloy.com. Uh, we're very active on LinkedIn. You know, please follow us on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me, uh, Melanie Lang, on LinkedIn. I should be pretty easy to find on there. Uh, and then you can also send us an email at info at formalloy.com if you want to get that conversation started. So 
my call to action would be don't wait any longer. There's a bunch of amazing technology out there. If if uh, our DD technology is not the right fit, there could be another one that is. So, you know, start reaching out to people and start your own additive manufacturing journey today. Definitely. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, audience, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, and follow Melanie's call to action. Um, if you have a part that you've been thinking about making additively for a long time, um, take the first steps today to try to actually make that happen. Um, and there are a lot of friendly people in the additive community who um, would be happy to advise you in how that might actually be feasible. Um, feel free to find 3dprintauthority.com to find um, the show notes for this episode, the full video, audio, and all other episodes. Um, until next time, uh, Melanie, I look forward to connecting in the future. Thank you. Hey, you wonderful human. I know I said it already, but thank you for taking some time out of your day to listen to the podcast. I have a lot of fun making it, and I appreciate that other people might enjoy listening. If you did enjoy this episode, it would make my day if you took just eight seconds to tap the like button and or subscribe to 3D Print Authority. That way you don't miss new episodes when they come out every single week. Happy printing.